Coming up on West Side Stories, we dig deeper into the issue of sexual assault on college campuses. And we take a look at how a local organization is helping the homeless population. Plus, join us in downtown Grand Rapids as we look back at what Art Prize had to offer this year. All that and more next on West Side Stories. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications. Inspiring thought, perfecting practice. Welcome to West Side Stories. I'm Preston Donikuski. And I'm Kelly Hubbard. In the wake of Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation, sexual assault is in the national spotlight. In our first story this week, reporter Mackenzie Sorrell interviews the victim of a sexual assault at Grand Valley State University and reveals why some victims choose not to report the crime. I told him that I didn't want to do this and he mostly just got mad. And then I basically just like shoved him off of me and um, like ran out the door. This GVSU student is a victim of sexual assault, so she didn't want us to use her real name. For the purpose of this story, we will call her Sarah. According to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, sexual assault is a real problem on college campuses. One in five women are sexually assaulted while in college. Sarah is one of them. So it was my roommate's birthday and we were at her house partying and these guys that came over and we'd all been drinking a lot and then um, the cops came like shut down the party or whatever and they were like, well, you guys should just come back to our house and drink. And we were like, okay, like cool. And then um, this guy like took my hand and was like, let's go um, in my room. And I was like, okay, like he's nice, he's cool, whatever. Like I'd like to hang out with him. So I went in his room and then like stuff started happening and that's when it got, it like went very downhill. Sarah resisted his sexual advances, but he wouldn't stop. She said he got mad, but Sarah was able to push him off and make her escape. Grand Valley has an informed consent policy in place to help students understand how to deal with situations like Sarah's. Our view is that it's no longer what we used to call no, no means no, it's, it's yes means yes. And previous consent doesn't necessarily imply future consent. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, sexual assault is defined as any type of sexual activity or contact that you do not consent to. Sexual assault is not limited to rape. It also includes sexual coercion. According to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, over 90% of sexual assault victims on college campuses do not report the assault. We find that individuals who experience sexual violence oftentimes will feel guilt or, or blame themselves for that experience. Um, sometimes it's about whether or not they feel like they're going to be believed or if they're going to be supported. When Sarah returned to her apartment after the assault, she immediately told her friends what had happened. She couldn't believe their response. I was met with just like skepticism and like, are you positive that's what happened? Are you positive? It was a lot of like condescending. I just, that was like a feeling that I've never felt before. Grand Valley offers a variety of support systems for victim survivors. The Gay R. Davis Center for Women and Gender Equity offers victim advocacy to all members of the university community. A victim advocate's job is to simply help victims deal with the aftermath of an assault. What we try to do here through our victim advocacy program is allow that person to sit and talk with a victim advocate about what their options are. Jen Rich says that the goal of the program is to make sure victims feel supported and to help reduce anxiety that often occurs after a sexual assault. According to Jen Rich, nationwide there has been a shift in how we treat women that come forward. The hashtag MeToo movement has given victims courage to share their story. However, victims like Sarah have very little evidence to prove their assaults. I guess I'm scared if I would have come forward that he would have been like, nope, 
that did not happen. There is no evidence. And, like, there isn't what I'm going to say. Oftentimes when sexual assault happens, there are very few witnesses or no witnesses to that event. Cornelia says many women hesitate to come forward. They think no one will believe them. But statistics say they should. According to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, over 90 percent of sexual assault allegations turn out to be true. To be comfortable believing people who have been sexually assaulted and not finding a million reasons for why they should have done X, Y, and Z differently and instead say, I believe you. While the Kavanaugh confirmation process has kept the sexual assault issue in the spotlight, individual stories like Sarah's emphasize the importance of sexual assault awareness on college campuses. Grand Valley says that we can create a safer community by being active bystanders. There are three ways you can do this. First, speak up. If you see something, say something. Second, always listen. Be open to a person seeking help. A third way is to intervene. Small interventions can make a big difference in a questionable situation. Although Sarah will never forget what happened to her that night, she says that she is doing better now. Sarah also says that believing victims is ultimately what will make victims come forward. In Allendale, I'm Mackenzie Sorrell. Thanks, Mackenzie. You can find more information about Grand Valley State's sexual assault policy and resources for sexual assault victims on GVSU's website. In Grand Rapids, our prize is over for this year, but some artists never leave the city. In fact, on certain afternoons along a stop on Ionia Avenue, you can meet a man with no home but a passion for art. Reporter Sam Hall has his story. In Grand Rapids, creativity can be found far beyond the art prize entries in downtown galleries. On certain afternoons, in a stoop along Ionia Avenue, you may meet Anthony Lazar, a man with no home but a passion for art. Uh, I'm an artist that does metal sculptures right downtown on the street. Um, I was staying at Mel Trotter Mission. Uh, 2010, I got uh, stumbled into Heartside Ministry. Uh, started painting and doing things. Uh, bought a baby welder and started creating these sculptures. Lazar, like dozens of other homeless and transitioning individuals living in southern Grand Rapids, has turned to Heartside Ministries art program as a place to take a break from life on the street. Heartside's art studio, which is open to the public from 9 until 3, Monday through Friday, is piled high with sewing projects, paint-covered canvases, sculptures, and pottery. Anyone is welcome to drop in during the day, whether it be to browse the countless pieces of finished artwork or to stay a while and create something of their own. The ministry is brimming with materials to satisfy a wide range of creative needs. Heartside is not only an art studio, however. Many visitors are drawn to the ministry's other programs, which include counseling, tutoring, and free GED testing, to name a few. Many of the program's participants say they find relief in the art they create here, an outlet for emotions that would otherwise remain unexpressed.
Joanna Jelks has been coming to Heartside long before she became art coordinator here, and says that the community has taught her a lot about a group of people who are often forgotten. From the corner of Weston and Division in Grand Rapids, I'm Samuel Hall. Thanks, Sam. More information on Heartside and how you can contribute can be found on their website at www.heartside.org. It's hard to believe that just a couple weeks ago, Grand Rapids was packed to the brim with people experiencing Art Prize 10. Before the excitement died down, West Side Stories talked to some of the artists at this year's competition. Reporter Devin Deli takes us on a closer look at some of the art and artists that were featured at this year's competition. Art Prize artists may be competing for prize money, but to them it's about more than just the competition. Jessica Considine is a young artist from Livonia, Michigan, who says the Art Prize is giving her a chance to establish herself in the art world. I, <laughs> I like it a lot because it makes me feel like I'm, you know, I'm like at the point that I'm supposed to be. Her entry this year is a metal sculpture titled Mind, Body, Spirit. And not only has Art Prize given her exposure, but she says that it's also given her a chance to discuss why she creates in the first place. My art, I'm just making these things to, I guess, uh, find the authentic self that I know that I am. And sometimes we lose that through time. And um, I feel like expressing yourself through different stuff is a way to figure out who that person is and like come home again. Jessica's art is done through her company's Sculpted Roots. She says that going full time has changed her views on art and now she wants to communicate the idea that art can transform lives. I am totally a different person than I ever used to be. Um, art has given me confidence and like self-love and like respect for like me and everybody around me that like I didn't have before. And I like, I was able to accept the flaws and characteristic flaws that I had in myself and I was able to bring them to the table so that I could move forward. Inside the Harris building we talked to Roseanne Cody about her painting The Fitting Room which is based off of a photo that she took of her three daughters while they were shopping for prom dresses. My daughter tried on this gown that was extremely expensive and I said I told I encouraged her I said you really need to know what this feels like to have that princessy moment you know even though we're not going to be able to afford this gown try it on and just see what it feels and and she put it on and she stepped up on this platform that was surrounded by mirrors and it was just absolutely breathtaking you could see the 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 daughter on the left is was almost like gasping it was it was just beautiful and it's a time that I won't be able to get back Cody says that the mother-daughter theme in her painting has had a much bigger response than she ever anticipated and she says that it's been allowing her to connect with the people she meets on a deeper level. I had three different women at three different times hugging me and we were crying. Uh, one of them had lost her daughter. She was killed and she was like, I'm never gonna have this moment again. And another one um, shared with me that she had all sons and she said, you know, I'm never gonna have that. Across the room from Cody, Judy Nada took a more interactive approach to her work. The art of conversation encourages those passing by to stop and stay a while. Each table is built around a different theme or memory from Nada's own life, and it's been allowing those who participate to get to know each other a little better. Two guys who had been friends for almost 60 years, who really thought they knew everything about each other and didn't really want to do this, sat down at the grandfather table, and after they were here for about a half an hour, um, they finally got up and one of them walked away, and the other fellow came to me and said, I knew he was a good friend, but I really didn't know how good of a friend he was until we answered some of these questions. Each table features question prompts, many of which might seem out of place in a normal conversation. But according to Nada, this actually allows for more meaningful interactions, something that she thinks doesn't happen enough. Our lives are busy. And just to pause for a moment and remember face-to-face -face conversation, that's what's really important. At the end of my life, I'm not going to wish I could have sent one more text or one more email. But I know when I've lost people close to me, I've always wished I had time for one more conversation. To these artists, Art Prize is about so much more than just the prize money. It's about connecting with the world around them and getting to share the message of their work with other people. Reporting from downtown Grand Rapids, I'm Devin Deli. 
Grand Rapids residents can expect a change next year as Art Prize moves away from being an annual event. Art Prize officials have yet to reveal what, if anything, would take its place during those off years. In today's turbulent political climate, journalists have been under fire and fact checking has become a critical part of the job. In this next story, we explore how GVSU is teaching students to use a powerful tool that journalists use to uncover the truth, the Freedom of Information Act. The late Helen Thomas, seen here with former President Obama, was an American journalist who spent years on the White House press corps, once said, we don't go into journalism to be popular. It is our job to seek the truth and put constant pressure on our leaders until we get answers. One way to do that job is by using the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, as it's called. The Freedom of Information Act, also known as FOIA, is a law that keeps citizens in the know about their government. It allows the public to access information from federally funded institutions. After hearing about a FOIA event in Illinois, students and faculty from Grand Valley State University knew they wanted to bring the idea home with them, creating the first ever West Michigan FOIA Fest. Well, our, our democracy generally runs better when people have more information about what the government is doing so that then they can make more informed decisions. So these laws, the FOIA laws, are very important tools in helping people to have that information so it can be shared publicly and then people can make decisions about how they want the government and the country to be. So when Professor Kelly Lowenstein told me about FOIA Fest that was happening in Chicago, I knew we needed to have something like that here at Grand Valley. FOIA Fest brought together people from all over the world, including Mike Morrissey, the co-founder of Muckrock. Muckrock is a nonprofit FOIA organization based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The company makes it easier for citizens to find government documents. You know, I was really kind of fascinated by sort of the role that public records play in kind of keeping our democracy informed. Everything from sort of how government spends its money, our money to sort of how we interact and understand how policies are being enacted. Morrissey was able to share his knowledge with not only aspiring journalists, but with others in the community. Students and faculty at GVSU were happy with the outcome of the event. Tonight we had an awesome turnout from the public, from faculty members at Grand Valley, a ton of journalism students. We had PR students here. There was just so much support from Grand Rapids and Grand Valley's community that it was, it was beyond expectations. We, we, we hope that this is the first of an annual tradition, Callie. So what I would like to do going forward is to have more participation from more schools and more countries, and then together choose a common topic. Professor Kelly Lowenstein hopes that in the future, people from all over the world can come together and do a joint reporting project. From West Side Stories, I'm Kelly Hubbard. If you or someone you know is interested in attending the next FOIA Fest, you can follow the Twitter hashtag GVFOIAFest for updates. As fall nears here in western Michigan, fall traditions will be on the mind of many Michiganders. Football, hay rides, and bonfires all signal the end of summer. But as Jake O'Donnell shows us, perhaps the most iconic autumn activity is visiting a good old-fashioned cider mill. It is the busiest time of the year at Hudsonville's Post Family Farm as families from all over West Michigan come to satisfy their fall cravings. The farm was purchased by the Post family nearly 50 years ago, and since 1997, has become especially famous for one thing, their donuts. We like to say we're a pumpkin farm, but a lot of people like to call us the donut farm because we are capable of putting out so many donuts and they're pretty good tasting as well, apparently. Post Family Farm Donuts originally began as an idea to keep hungry school children happy. However, since the first batch was made in the Post Kitchen, the family has had their hands full, keeping up with West Michigan's demands. We can make up to 340 dozen donuts an hour with our machine. So from nine little donuts at a time, now we're up to 340 dozen. Although not originally theirs, the posts have tweaked their donut recipe over the years to give it a unique flair. Their secret ingredient? What else? Pumpkin. It's basically a combination of flour and water and a little bit of pumpkin. So we do put pumpkin in the pumpkin donut. You mix up the flour, water, and the pumpkin, 
and then it has to rest for a few minutes to let the yeast rise and let it do its thing. And then we pour it into our one of our three machines that we use, one of our three fryers that we use to make the donuts and goes through the fryer and once they come out at the other end, we put some icing on them or we put uh, cinnamon sugar on them for in the fall. Throughout the years, the donuts have brought families from all over the area together, but none more than the Posts, who now have a new generation excited about working in the family business. What's your favorite thing about working on your family's farm? Probably working with the horses and just getting to getting relationships with all of them. All right, and uh, what is your favorite part here about fall coming up? Probably the pumpkin donuts. <laughs> it's fun working with family, and I think the, with the family too, we take pride in the property and uh, what we offer, and I think it helps make it for a fun family atmosphere. And we've got families that have been coming here for years, and now they're taking their kids here to the farm. So we really appreciate the family atmosphere because we are family run. In addition to donuts, for the next few months, Post Family Farm will be offering a variety of different fall themed activities for all ages, including hay rides, square dances, bonfires, and corn mazes. We also have our school tours, and that starts mid-September all the way through the end of October. We have school tours that come through, and then we are open to the general public as well. We have our fun farm days, Monday through Friday, and then we have the festivals on Saturdays, and we sell donuts the whole time. If you are unable to visit Post Family Farm this fall, fear not. The Posts open up their facilities for weddings and special events all throughout the year and even for sleigh rides during the winter. With fall right around the corner here in West Michigan, Post Family Farm is the place to come for some traditional family fun and some great tasting donuts. Reporting from Hudsonville, I'm Jake O'Donnell. Mmm, these are good. Thanks, Jake. Donuts are available until November 3rd, and a list of Post Family Farm's upcoming fall events can be found on their website. Now it's time for our weekly story from WGVU Digital Studios. Check it out. We are here at Rosa Parks Circle where your cart is now. This is pretty exciting to have. Yes. You have a restaurant, but you've got the cart. How exciting is this? Oh my God, I'm so excited for real. This is a, a big, a big uh, step for me. <laughs> What's the most exciting thing about taking your what you do at your restaurant and bringing it here downtown so more people can try it? I think we have a very good product. You know, we have good tamales. So uh, we have 15 in the restaurant. So uh, we have the most five populars over here. And the most excited, excited thing is that uh, the car has no noise. And that's, that's a pretty, uh, the most important thing for me because sometimes I can hear the people over there and you know, in a regular food truck, it's a lot of noise. And uh, we have, they have to use a lot of power. So our car is a solar panel, so it's no, no, no power. How busy have you been? Very busy, for real. Usually before we have the car, we make like 900 tamales every day. So right now, uh, I'm so excited. We had to make like 100, 1,050, 100 tamales. Yeah, especially Tuesdays when we have really here in Rosa Park. It's very busy for us, yep. What is, what goes into a tamale and the making of it versus say, uh, it's different than an enchilada or a burrito because, it, uh, tell me about it, it's very Yeah, the tamales is a little hard process, you know, for us. Uh, first we had to prepare the, the, the chicken or the pork. We had to boil for two hours. We had to boil the, uh, the salsa and uh, prepare the, the, the meat already cook it with the salsa and we have to prepare the masa so with uh, it's, it's not our masa it's kind of very different from the people who made tamales because our masa has no lard 
we have um, we use vegetable oil and we the, the most we don't use a lot of salt so that is very healthy and uh, we have the vegetarian option too so nobody else has over here everything's made from scratch right yes. You make everything? Everything. We start six in the morning every day, make tamales, so the tamales are fresh every day. And, and the tamale is it's the corn husk, right? Yeah, Tell me about the, that. The, yeah, the tamales inside the corn husk. We use the corn husk to wrap the tamale. So people don't know the tamale has to fill it. And some, sometimes they try to eat with the corn husk. So it's, it's not the way we eat the tamales. <laughs> Tamale eating 101. Do yeah. not eat the, the corn, corn husk. <laughs> We want to give a special thanks to WGVU Digital Studios for giving us content that we can bring to you every week. Of course, and that is all the time we have for you this week. I'm Preston Donikuski. And I'm Kelly Hubbard. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications. Inspiring thought, perfecting practice.